Hello, my name's Alan Foom, and today I'm going to talk about petroleum source rocks. It's a basic introduction, give people an understanding of where oil and gas actually comes from. So we have two pictures here. We have an example of the shale. This is the Marcella Shale from the Devonian in northeastern the United States. A very little diagram showing how organic matter within rocks is transferred through heat and pressure into hydrocarbons. So, what is a source rock? So, petroleum and uh, oil and natural gas, source from organic matter. Now, organic matter has been initially deposited in a sedimentary rock. It's then been matured by heating uh, over time, which then breaks the organic matter down into its component hydrocarbons, so effectively cooking. These hydrocarbons then have to be expelled into the petroleum system. They eventually will get trapped to form oil fields, and most of them, however, will escape. So, source rock rock containing the organic matter. So source rock, shale, mudstone, sometimes limestone, organic matter, oil. So this is a petroleum system, a diagram that shows that. And what we're looking at is this part here, which is the source rock. Hydrocarbons are then cooked. They then migrate upwards because they're buoyant relative to water and then get trapped. But that will be subjects of uh, future videos. So we're concentrating on the source rock. So how does this fit into everything altogether? petroleum system is located here. So we have a basin, which is a geographic area uh, filled with sedimentary rocks, uh, which contains, which may or may not contain hydrocarbons with oil fields or gas fields. Then we have a petroleum system, and most petroleum systems are focused on the source rock, because this is what we're focusing on. Beyond that are petroleum plays. They tend to be focused on the reservoir. So, for example, you would have the Jurassic play in the North Sea, you have the Paleocene play in the North Sea, um, the um, uh, chalk play in the, in the North Sea, um, etc. And then you will have discoveries, prospects, and leads, which are the individual features that a geologist would look to drill to find oil and gas. We're focusing on a petroleum system, which is the feeder to all of that. Now, some reservoir rocks may be fed from several different petroleum systems, but for instance, in the UK, uh, in the north, in the northern central North Sea, the Kimmeridge clay is the main source rock. So why is this important? In a nutshell, if we don't have a source rock, we don't have a petroleum system. Game over. And the lack of source rock and migration are main causes of dry holes in frontier basins. Some of these dry holes are expensive. We're talking tens of millions up to $100 million a well. A lot of money. And when you have a 1 in 10 chance of it working, kind of scary. However, when it does work, it more than makes up for the failures. So this is a paper by uh, Randolph Goulding in the American Association of Petroleum Geologists. And why do wells fail? So seal, which is the cap rock to keep the hydrocarbons in the trap. Then you have the reservoir, the holder of the hydrocarbons. And then you have the charge, which is the petroleum system. Now mature areas tends to be the seal that fails the most. I've got a video on seals on my YouTube channel. Please have a look at that. Then you have the reservoir, which kind of fails um, some of the time. Reservoir tends to be where geologists tend to focus their attention uh, because, this, you know, sedimentologists tend to like looking at those particular rocks. They tend to be more interesting. But the source rock is the main question. Now, in mature areas, the source rock's kind of taken care of, although local charge is a bit of an issue. In extending plays, well, how far does a source rock extend? But in a new play, we really don't know. So this is something which we need to look at when we look at, uh, at the beginning. But people who have been working in mature plays tend to take it for granted. Maybe they shouldn't. So how are source rocks created? Basically, it's nicknamed, oil is nicknamed dinosaur juice, and that's basically what it is. Well, not dinosaurs, more smaller creatures than that. Uh, now, the organic matter, remains of dead plants, dead animals, uh, falls down and gets deposited with other rocks. You tend to look for mud rocks, shales and coals. I'll mainly be focusing on mud rocks and shales. Coals are a little bit different. And they tend to be deposited in the deeper parts of sedimentary basins, deep seas, lakes, swamps. What you really need is to protect the organic matter from being oxidized. So either rapid burial or anoxic stagnant water. And that would help preserve the hydrocarbons. Next question you've got to ask is, how rich is your source rock? 
And this is measured by something called total organic content. So that's the portion of the rock uh, by weight, which is made up of organic matter. And generally, the more, the better. Exceptional source rocks, such as the aforementioned Kimmich clay from the North Sea, can have total organic context of up to 15%. That's kind of rare. You know, mostly good ones tend to be between the 2 5%. Uh, somewhat less than that tends to be, uh, tends to be less good. Uh, what you really need is as good as possible. And one way of uh, determining that very quickly, uh, apart from all the geochemical analysis, which I'll talk about a little bit about in a minute, is the high rich source, high TOC rich source rocks tend to have very high gamma ray values due to the high uranium content. So a big spike on the gamma ray, you know, up to over 150 units. Okay, so how is it all deposited and what does it all come from? Now, the precursor to hydrocarbons is something called kerogen. It's the organic matter within the source rocks. And there are four basic types of kerogen. So type 1, also known as alginite or sapropellic kerogen, it's a type of kerogen desired from algae. It tends to be deposited in lakes, um, sometimes stagnant seas, and it tends to be oil prone. Type 2, which is liptonite, it's also oil prone, but it's a bit gassier than type 1. It tends to be deposited in restricted marine conditions, mainly composed of plankton. Type 3, which is called vitronite or humic kerogen, is a type of kerogen derived mostly from plant matter in terrestrial conditions, such as swamps, for example. There's also some lakes. And this kerogen type also includes coals. It tends to be more gas prone, but it does produce some liquid hydrocarbons. And oils that have some vitronite as part of the source rock tend to have higher wax contents, which is a bit of a problem when you're trying to uh, produce it because it clogs up the pipes. And type 4 inertionite is spent tree worked oxidized material which has limited generation or none, no generation potential, so we will just put that to one side. And this was all put together in something called a Van Crevelin diagram. Type 1, type 2, type 3. So on the y-axis we have the hydrogen carbon atomic ratio, so basically longer chain alkanes, and an oxygen carbon atomic ratio. And as you heat the uh, oil and gas, you will end up going towards this corner here with low OC, low HC. Effectively, you'll end up with graphite eventually. Um, but you can see that they have slightly different paths. And these areas here are where you have gas generation and oil generation. I'll come to the thermal diagram in a second. So both ratios decrease as hydrocarbons are generated. So this is thermal maturity. So as you bury rocks, you heat them up. And with heat, over a certain um, distance, you'll come into the oil window where the oils are driven off from the source rock. And then later you go into the wet gas window, which is when slightly uh, lighter um, hydrocarbons, uh, gases such as pentane, ethane, butane, etc., are driven off. And eventually you get dry gas or methane, and eventually you'll end up with graphite. So diagenesis, catagenesis, metagenesis. And these numbers for RO is the vitronite reflectance. Now, vitronite is a shiny organic molecule derived from plant matter. And what you do is you put it into a, a dish with, uh, with an oil base. You look at it under a microscope with, uh, with light and gives you reflectivity. So when you have reflectivity of 0.6%, that's when the oil starts. 1.1 is when the uh, oil tends to finish and the gas starts, and when it's over three, you tend to gas generation. But there's contamination, danger is involved, and you may also need, uh, I do actually need to have plant matter in the system to do that, which is a problem with some older oils, i.e. anything pre-Devonian before plants, land plants evolved, and also pure marine source rocks. So how do you look at the thermal maturity of that? This is done using pyrolysis, where you heat a rock sample in a laboratory, and you measure the yields of hydrocarbons at various uh, temperatures. And an example of that is a technique called rock eval. So aim of this technique is to find out how much oil and gas has been generated, and how much further potential there is. So you have existing hydrocarbons at, S, at peak S1 at 300, S2 hydrocarbons generated by heating the kerogen, so that's future potential, and S4 at 500 degrees when you start getting off CO2. Uh, the key point here is using this technique, you will find out how much hydrocarbon is left. So these are different thermal maturity values, T max is equivalent to vitronites for source rocks that have relatively low amounts of vitronite because of their marine origin 
or because they are uh, before plants have been evolved. Another important factor which Rockefeller also gives you is the hydrogen index. So the hydrogen index is uh, basically the S2 peak, as, as given in the Rockefeller, times 100, and gives you an idea of how much hydrocarbon may be left to be remaining to be generated. So that gives you a little bit about maturities. So how do we estimate all of these things out when we don't actually have a sample or when we have a sample, we try to extend it further. This is something called basin modeling. Uh, basin modeling is a mathematical model which you use to predict uh, how much hydrocarbon has been generated. When was the hydrocarbon generated, both start and end, because that fits in with all the other parts of your petroleum system to figure out where something may or may not work. And what type of hydrocarbon has also been generated, whether it's oil, whether it's ga dry gas, whether it's wet gas. And some of the more advanced models can give you an idea as to where the hydrocarbons have ended up. Is your prospect likely to be charged? There are three basic types of basin modeling. The simplest one is 1D, where you model an existing well or pseudo well, and you backstrip that and, and also include um, how much burial has happened and how much uh, exhumation has happened and what the geothermal gradients would have been through time. Now, all of these are estimates. So there's some uncertainty with there, but it can give you an idea of the timing of the oil and gas generation expulsion, and also give you some idea of what the amount that could have happened per unit area, which you can then multiply by the area of your potential source kitchen. 2D basin modeling is uh, done using a 2D section, effectively a seismic section when you then convert into depth, you model where the source rock is, you backstrip the section to uh, uh, remove the burial history, you add in the geothermal gradients, and you can then see whether your prospect could have been charged and when it could have been charged and what it could have been charged with. 3D modeling is even more sophisticated where you effectively build a model for the whole basin or an area around your prospect. Uh, you can do, produce more sophisticated results, you know, direction of expulsion, where the source kitchens have been, when they've been active, you can estimate the total hydrocarbon volumes generated, which is a useful yet to find estimation. And you can start ranking, ranking your prospects in terms of charge risk and also estimate your charge risk uh, together with that. And the models can be validated by history matching. So if your model predicts something different to what history has happened, uh, there's obviously something not quite right with the model. So you need to alter that until it fits. And you can compare that also with uh, values such as V0 and Tmax to calibrate it even further. Uh, matching existing models against existing discoveries against the models to test the validity. So to quickly summarize, why is source rock important? No source rock, no hydrocarbon. And lack of source rock and migration, the main cause of dry holes in frontier basins, and it can still give you unpleasant surprises, even in relatively mature areas. Uh, and geologists tend to work in mature basins tend to take it for granted and they shouldn't. Source rocks are rare, need the right sedimentary environment, right organic matter content, right burial, right heat flow, right preservation, and the right timing, together with the part where the hydrocarbons to reach the traps. It's amazing you find anything at all for so many things that have to go right. And a basin modeling and geochemistry can help us, tr us try to understand a petroleum system. No model is ever perfect. But it's prediction, not always reality, but models, although somebody said that all models are wrong, some models are useful. We can test ideas, we can try to understand the risks. So why are source rocks important? Foundation of the petroleum system. Some examples of source rocks, such as Kimbridge clay, offshore outcrop in Dorset, Marcellus, and uh, Eagleford in Texas. Thank you very much.